Welcome to a Pax Britannica Extra. An interview with Mike Duncan. Welcome to a very special episode of Pax Britannica. My guest is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Storm Before the Storm, author of the upcoming biography, Citizen Lafayette, as well as the creator of a couple of podcasts that you've probably heard of, The History of Rome and Revolutions. To be honest, if you've seen the title, you don't really need an introduction. He is one of the founding fathers of the history podcasting genre, and an inspiration to hundreds, if not thousands, of podcasters like myself. Mike Duncan. Thank you so much for joining me here in Boston. Thank you for having me. And uh, my publisher thanks you for leading <laughs> with the books <laughs> rather than the podcast. That's great. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. I asked you on to Pax Britannica because the narrative is, it's just started the reign of Charles I. Okay. And there's an elephant looming on the horizon that I'm trying not to touch on too much yet because, you know, his, his actual reign is a reign on its own. It doesn't, it isn't just a prelude to what comes after, but... The English Civil War is coming. Mm -hmm. And so considering that revolutions began with the English Revolution, I thought I'd bring you on. Now, obviously, revolutions began a long time ago. Six, yes. Over six years now. Yeah. It was meant to be. It was It was a project that was going to take me three years to do originally. Mm, and three. now I'm in Now I'm in six. And That's it'll be... Twice as long? Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be till the summer of 2021 when it actually finishes. So it'll be... Is that eight years total? Seven, almost eight. We're history podcasters. Yeah, we should know Not dates. STEM podcasters. No, God, no. We can't expect no. us to do math. Math is awful. Yeah. I hate it. Oh. Um, so, obviously, yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, um, So, let's just open up with how, what, what, what are some things you've noticed have changed about history podcasting over those years? And obviously, History of Rome was even earlier than that. So, how have you, if you could sum up, you know, a decade of changes in it, just a few words. Um, I think, for starters, I mean, just in my own life in terms of the society that I interact with like on a daily basis when I started doing the history of Rome I would say I'm doing this podcast and people would say what's a podcast and I would say it's like a radio show but like on demand and people would say oh that's really interesting and then a couple of years went by and I would say I do this podcast and people would say Oh, I've heard a podcast. Those those are really cool. Those are cool, huh? And I say, yeah. And then a couple more years went by, and I would say, I would say, I, I this is basically what happens now is I say I do a podcast, and they go, everybody has a podcast, and I, <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's just really true. And then what I'm hoping is that in like five years or something, um, that I'll say. I'll say, yeah, I do this podcast, and people say, people still do podcasts? Is that that's still a thing? So that's that's the journey that I feel like I'm on. But really, a, a lot of it, um, you know, to, not to get into the the fact that it's being taken over by more corporate interests and people who are doing this on a more professional basis. Obviously, that is what's going to happen to any form of media. Mm. Um, there is still space for independent podcasters like me and like you, people who are just going to sit down and do shows that they're passionate about. And there continues to be, there's very little difference in terms of my own personal uh, uh, schedule when it yeah. comes to putting out a show. I read, I write, I, uh, I edit the transcripts, I read the transcripts, I hit send. That fundamental apparatus is still exactly what it, what it always was. Yeah. And you don't see that changing? I really hope not. I really yeah. hope not. I mean, um, you know, it's it. I don't like the fact that you know there's paywall stuff going up, and people are like signing exclusive contracts with this or that um, provider. Uh, I'm I am really supportive of independent podcasting and independent podcasters. Um, so I'm hoping that there will always be a space for us and a space for listeners to be able to come, and there just won't be anybody between us and the audience that we want to that we want to talk to. Because what, what, I mean, one of the great things about podcasting when I started was that if I had gone out and like pitched the history of Rome to somebody, uh, and I would say, 
I have this idea for a show. And I'm like, what would you do? I, I'm going to narrate the entire history of the Roman Empire from beginning to end. And I'm going to do it in a very monotone voice. And there's not going to be any um, sound effects. And there's not going to, and they're going to be like, nobody will, nobody will yeah. listen to that. Like, <laughs> of course, no, please leave our offices. Um, but the fact that nobody could really say no to me, I could just start uploading the content that I was making. I found an audience and my audience found me. And I'm hoping that the internet stays open enough that that continues to happen for us. We can only hope. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, uh, that's one, that is absolutely one of the strengths of podcasting. And, you know, I think a lot, once the, the bandwagon moves on, mm -hmm. I think a lot of those corporate people will either they'll make it work or they won't and they'll move on to the next big thing and then they'll leave us alone yeah and i'm well, i'm hoping some of them stick around because yeah. it could because the the advertising money is pretty good that is true, that <laughs> is pretty like, true. i don't want to say anything <laughs> bad about that um i just don't want anybody to stand between an audience finding content that they like and somebody who wants to produce content being able to find an audience that yeah. will enjoy their content i just I, i'm hoping that that stays the same and that still exists you know we can still put out shows every day even sure. right now today and i've been doing this for um 12 years now 12 and that, years. Ha that hasn't changed yeah that's great so um you mentioned your schedule is pretty much the same as it's always been but mm -hmm. obviously since you began you've you know branched out into the literary field um so how do you find writing for reading different to writing for speaking um, writing for reading, uh, requires about 20 or 30 more pass throughs on, on editing, right? You really have to make sure that every sentence is crystal clear yeah. and perfect so mm -hmm. that it can read on its own and that each sentence flows naturally into the next sentence and each paragraph leads into the next paragraph and each page continues so that pe because people have to turn their own page yeah. you know when you're reading a book you have to turn your own page and that's uh in many ways it's not incumbent on the reader to like fight their way through something that's really hard or mm. dance or like you know maybe this is just poorly written i think that's something that is a difference between good writing and bad writing and that if if the good writing keeps you turning the page now if i sit down and write a script i can read it to you yeah. and if a sentence is a bit jarbled or incoherent i can you know enunciate certain parts of the sentence i can give emphasis on on areas uh to to carry what might on the page look a little sloppy yeah. but i can read it out loud and have it make sense to you where i can't rely on that when i'm writing a book um so it requires uh way more intensive uh editing mostly mm. for clarity yes yes you have to the words have to stand on the road they absolutely nothing do. else you can yeah, do there's nothing, nothing else i can do for you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so you know again try and get my get into the good books of your publisher how is citizen lafayette coming along Citizen Lafayette is coming along great. I am the, what I'm doing after sound education is uh, going out to Cornell to do some more research. They have a big archive of Lafayette papers out there. And so I'll be spending two and a half weeks out at a library in Cornell. And that's pretty much the end of like the research phase of the book. And there's parts of the manuscript that are written. And I am really happy with what is sort of dripping out of my fingers with well, the editing as i say the editing process will be its own oh, yeah. its own adventure um but i really really love uh what i have written so far i'm very excited about the book and uh, i can't wait to get it out there because i think it's um i'm really happy with it well that's the important <laughs> i mean i and yeah. that you know i've always i've always uh counted on my own taste you know there, i have nobody else really to bounce things off of except you know just in my own head um do I, am I interested in this? Do I like this? Is this enjoyable for me? And if I'm interested in it and I think it's fun and I'm enjoying doing it, mm. I think that that, and this is true, I think for any podcaster or any writer, that, that comes across to the reader or to the listener. And if you are not interested and you're not enjoying what you're doing, I think that also will turn people off. So I, I was extremely pleased when I sat down and actually started writing. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, this is this is great fun. I'm having a great deal of fun writing this. Um, it's not going to be like what the storm before the storm was. Yeah. And I think it's not going to be exactly what people um, might be expecting from me. Uh, and uh, I, I think it'll be cool. So you mentioned, yeah, you're going up to Cornell to the archives. Is mm -hmm. that the first? Obviously, you wrote Storm Before the Storm, but I'm imagining a lot of the, because they're the Roman classics, a lot mm -hmm. of them are going to be digitized. Mm -hmm. Is this your first time going into an archive? How are you finding uh, doing primer research? Um, no, it's not the first time I've been into an archive. I did, uh, I did grad school 
Um, oh, of course I did grad did, school yeah. stuff. And so I've been, and, and also, I mean, for the Lafayette book, I've, you know, I'm going out to Cornell to do this last sort of round, but there's stuff in, uh, there's stuff in Paris. And then there was, uh, there was stuff at the university of Chicago. There's a guy named, uh, Louis Gottschalk, uh, Louis Gottschalk. I don't know. Now I'm, now I'm Parisian. So I, so I, so I see a Louis and I'm just like, oh, it's Louis, but it's probably Louis Gottschalk, of course. Um, he's like the preeminent biographer of Lafayette. He's a 20th century guy and he was out of the university of Chicago. So all of his papers are in the university of Chicago archives. And so I, I went down there and, and fumbled around in his paperwork and looked at all his little scrawling notes. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I do consider myself though. I, I do say for simplicity's sake these days, especially since I moved to France, you know, and people are like, what do you do? And I have, um, a, a level of French that I can communicate pretty well, but I'm a podcaster who also sometimes writes books. And then I've got, you know, some other things that I do. Mostly I just am at Je suis historien. So I'm a historian. That's what I tell people. But there is, I, I am occupying a space that is not go to the archives, analyze primary source documents, and then produce sort of like new research on, on a couple of boxes that mm. have never been touched before. Um, I am much more in the take the collected knowledge that, that scholars have done, that academics have done, and present it to the general population. And I'm a popularizer of history. That's, yeah. you know, that's what I do. Um, so, so there are some things, I mean, uh, that will be new-ish um, in terms of Lafayette's later life, right, which I don't think really ever gets touched on mm -hmm. in popular ways. By the time you get to the French Revolution, most people are ready to wrap up their biography of Lafayette and they just sort of leave the whole back third of his life mm -hmm. untouched. So, so that's been the part that I would say that I've done the most to bring stuff that, at least in the popular press, hasn't really seen the light of day. And how have you found, um, I mean, you spoke about it a little bit with the release of Storm Before the Storm, um, but how have you found the... You started calling yourself a historian just for uh, efficiency sake. If it, it, yeah, it's, it's, thing, it's simplicity. How have you and found And because my French the, is bad. <laughs> it's as good a reason as any, but how right. have you found the um, academic response to it? Because I know that, um, generally speaking, whenever I see like people historians discussing history of Rome or revolutions online, uh, academics seem pretty happy with it. Yeah. Um, my experience, and I think this might be a bit of like self-selection bias, but... Uh, the the historians or academics that I work with, or not that I work with, but that I've talked to, yeah. you know, like on Twitter, or, um, you know, over email or in person, are generally very supportive of what I'm up to and mm. what we are all up to over here. They think it's great yeah. um, to you know, to popularize um, all of this stuff um, on the understanding that you know we shouldn't be passing ourselves off as something uh, different than we are, but. I, I don't really encounter this archetypical grumbly academic who's sitting in the ivory tower and being like, who do you think you are? Yeah. You're but I'm sure those people exist, oh, yeah. but I think that I'm just not encountering them because they're off in their ivory tower yeah. grumbling about it. They hate it. the internet. Yeah they, yeah, they don't want to have anything to do with it, so we don't really interact with each other. So mostly I get positive feedback from people um, because – I, I mean I went and did a thing in, um, uh, a, a, in London – and that was with uh, an academic who, uh, of course, I'm jet lagged, so I'm blanking on her name. Um, but she was uh, working at is it King's College? Is King's that College London. Yeah. yeah so she's so yeah. So she's a, she's a classicist at King College London, uh, specifically doing like um, late Roman Republican politics. Mm. So I was a little like. What is this person going to say to me when I walk in the door? And she was thrilled that the the fact that there was a room full of people who were there to just talk about late Roman Republican politics. Mm -hmm. I have been able to generate a level of interest out there or cultivate people's already native interest for the thing and keep people uh, interested in the topic and keep it lively and then keep them and keep people wanting to go to school for it, um, keep people wanting to study it, hopefully sell a few of their books too. Um, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm sitting here uh, inventing interest for the Roman Empire, no. but I'm certainly, you know, I, I I got I got the bellow, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. And the thing that you know, I I'm blowing on the fire. Yeah. I'm keeping the fire going. I'm doing your bit. Yeah. Until I die, I I'll keep the fire going, and then I'll pass it off to somebody else. Okay. So, in fact, before I move on to actually talk about what we're here to talk about, you mentioned that you are finding uh, you you expect readers are going to find Citizen Lafayette very different to Storm Before the Storm. Yes. And is that solely because one is a, a narrative history and one is a biography? Or is there something else that uh, may 
surprise people. No, there's something else that may surprise people. Oh. And is it going to stay a surprise? I'm, um, I'm not going to get exclusive. You're, oh, she, she, it's it's a little bit more. It's more literary. Okay. Than what the storm before the storm was, uh, and w- and even what revolutions is or what the history of Rome is. I'm I'm writing right now in a voice that I haven't really ever used before, and I don't know if it's. I, I went back and looked at the because when I was going to have to tell my publisher like this is what I'm turning in. Um, you know, I went back and looked at the early emails that I was sending, and I actually did indicate pretty early on, like I want to do this uh, in a little bit more of a literary way. But I also think, and this is gonna this is gonna sound horrible. I might actually ask you to cut this part out. Okay. But you know, moving to Paris and living in Paris, I think has maybe soaked my brain a little bit in some different juices. Wine and, mostly. No, 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 not wine. Um, but there's something about it that's got me writing in a slightly different voice, and I'm I'm very happy about it. Yeah, well, I'm even more excited to read about it now. It's good. It's good shit, man. I can't wait. Let's talk about the English Revolution. Oh, yes. I yes. remember the English Revolution. So long ago. Six yes, years ago. it was. It was a long time ago. Um, so, how about, when was the last point of no return? When was the point of no return, rather? Uh, For Charles to win. Not just to keep his head, because obviously when he's in prison, he could have just said, he just could have agreed to the terms and continued being king and had a limit on his powers but he didn't. But when was the last point he could have won against English Parliament? Yeah. You sent me this question, and I gave it a great deal of thought. And it is... I mean, you want to just say, like, before the new model army Mm. came around. Um, And even then, because then you want to say... It it had to have been before the new model army came around. Because once the new model army comes around i think it's just kind of over for him that he's that charles is not going to be able to command the military forces or the or command the financial resources that are going to allow him to fight off a group of leaders who have now decided the only thing they care about is winning the war um because prior to the arrival of the new model army right like the the nobility the, the puritan nobles who had gone into revolt against him initially back in the late 1630s and early 1640s you know they they were fighting this war as a part of a negotiation tactic Mm. right they wanted you know they wanted charles to um just give them let let him into the ministry because basically they're like they're out there they're out there fighting battles because they want to be like they want to be chancellor of the exchequer like that's what that's what they were after um and then when the new model army comes around and all they care about is winning the war i think that that change in motivation for the quote-unquote parliamentary side really puts him back on his heels um, to the point where he's not really ever going to emerge from that. Of course, then when they do win the war, you know, Cromwell and uh, Fairfax, they're, they're offering him deals. They're trying to get him to save himself. But so the ultimate, um, the ultimate answer is to a certain degree, everybody offered him a dozen, 15 different chances to get through this without losing his head. And he rejected every single one of them. So is it not necessarily the case that Charles I was just temperamentally disinclined to getting through this without having his head chopped off a little bit? Possibly. He was a very stubborn man. He was, Um, he was, he was an unimaginative man, I think is that's like, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's his problem when, you know, when, when I was studying political philosophy in school, you know, uh, we read James the First. I mean, James the First is in the canon of like Western political philosophers yeah. is uh, developing a modern idea of the divine right of kings. And James was doing this in his off hours. You know, this is what he this is what he was doing. Mm. You know, like after work, he was sitting around developing these ideas. Um, but as a king, as an in the actual like practical mess of real politics, um, James was James was flexible. James could give and take. James could make concessions. James he could do all of these things. And then at night he'd go around and be like, ah, well, my power actually comes from God, and blah blah blah. Char- Charles read all that and took it literally, yeah. and believed that that is that was the single model that he needed to be preserving the same thing is going to be happening to um i you know not to skip to the end of revolutions but you know i'm doing the russian revolution right now and you know czar nicholas ii finds himself 
or he, he, in terms of his character, they're very similar mm-hmm. in that he has this very simplistic idea of what he is there to represent and what he is there to protect. And he has to protect it at all costs because he doesn't have the imaginative capacity to see a way forward for uh, the Russian Empire or in Charles I's case for his uh, main as, as king without latching on to this sort of weird theoretical structure that his dad had come up with while sitting around after work. Mm. And what about the last time that violence could have been avoided? So, obviously, once the parliament is called, there's a ticking time bomb, kind of. Yeah. There are many, I think it's Conrad Russell, basically identifies seven different things that all had to happen in order for the Civil War to start. Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, when was the last time that, you know, there wouldn't be violence? Before? Could could it have happened even after Charles fled London? Would it have to happen before that happened? I'm curious what your thoughts are. When was the last time that violence could have... Well, let me ask you. When do you think is the last time? Oh, that's not fair. No, no, I'm going to... No, (laughs) no, I'm going to turn this around on you. When do you think is the last time that violence could have been avoided? I think when... Charles uh, rejected the last petition from Parliament when he, when he before he fled. Um, if he'd stuck around and been able to swallow his pride, but you know mm-hmm. he probably never would have. You know, I think that would be the last. That was the last chance because then, if he'd managed to get Parliament on side, he would have then been able to have support against the Scots and put down the Irish. But that was the final straw for him, I would say. But then again, I haven't read that far ahead yet, so. You know, you've actually read more than me. I have, but it was also six years ago. And my true? and I do think that you know, by the time he had by the time he has fled London, mm. I think both sides are just completely dug in. Yeah. Um but what is so I mean, one of one of the great sort of themes of the English Civil War is at every step nobody really wanted to take the next step. Like on either side. Yeah. You know, royalists didn't want to be having this war. Parliamentarians didn't want to be having this war. They all thought that um, Edge Hill was just going to be it. Like, let's just have this one. We'll do this one thing. We'll go stand in a field. We'll push pikes at each other for a little while. Somebody will lose. And then that'll be the end of it. Like, we'll, we'll have our little, like, we'll have our thumb war mm. about, about. And then the next thing you know, that didn't happen. And then everybody kept waiting for the next battle to be, like, the decisive battle that solved it. And all the battles just kept being indecisive. So the violence just kept continuing and continuing and continuing, even though I don't think either side was really interested in it until, as I said, the new model army comes along. Um, and those guys did say, yeah, no, we're going to we're going to finish this thing. That's yeah. that's the whole point now. It's an interesting what if scenario, which is they're fun because you can never really know. But, yeah, it would have changed a lot. If violence had somehow been avoided or yeah. had stopped or hadn't gone to its final conclusion. And and I, I, run, I run into this problem all the time with what if questions. Um, you know, I get this about like the Roman, uh, like the fall of the Roman Republic. Yeah. People will ask me, oh, you know, like what could the Senate have done differently? And I, I have things that they could have done differently. But then when you list those things, oh, they could have they could have reformed, you know, uh, they, could, they could have issued some social reforms. You could, they could have done this. They could have done that. Um all of that, you have to back up to the very beginning and premise that by saying, well, the first thing is that they need to be completely different people with completely <laughs> different personalities than yeah. they actually had. And, you know, like, how could you have avoided, um, you know, violence? Well, ha- have Charles be a completely different person who, yeah. who had completely different priorities and completely different uh, degrees of self-confidence in himself. Uh, that he, he actually had some self-confidence. And so he didn't have to rely on these um, – uh, these theoretical frameworks of divine rights of king mm. to uh, to to withstand a challenge from parliament. He should have been able to negotiate better. Um, what if the Puritan lords had been different and you know not been so puritanical? Um, you know, there's there all there are all of these things, and all of them require the historical actors to like be different people mm. than they actually were. And what happened is that they just were the people that they were. And so what happened? I mean, you never want to say that any history is inevitable, but you put those people in that situation with those personalities. I mean, look what happened. Yeah. So speaking of those personalities, who is your favorite character, so to speak, of the British Civil Wars? There are there are two mm-hmm. that I really quite like. I like Lambert a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the uh, very long time ago, I I have he's still it's pretty far down now, but on my list of people that I would be interested in writing a biography about. Um, you know, because he's very much. 
wielding both the pen and the sword. Yeah. You know, those are, those are interesting people to me. Um, he's not just a great general. He's also, you know, writing the first written constitution in British history, right? English history, English certainly. History point, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think the Scots wrote down much. <laughs> <laughs> I should know more. I'm living in Aberdeen. I really should know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think know. that they wrote down much either. But so so Lambert, is, you know, he's a brilliant cavalry officer and he's writing constitutions. Like those two things, uh, you know, producing both of those at the same time. And, you know, one of my what ifs is, you know, what if they had given it to Lambert? What if Cromwell had pointed at Lambert and said, this is the guy? Mm-hmm. Um not my son, like, because I think what's, I mean, we're probably going to wind up talking about this, about whether or not Cromwell wanted to be king. Um, but what if Cromwell had pointed to Lambert and said, Lambert is the guy to carry this forward if and when I die? Um, because Lambert had the military um, ability and the intellectual capacity to defend what was at that point a republic, yeah. to, de- to, to defend militarily politically and intellectually the establishment of this new republic yeah. that they had founded i mean they chopped off the king's head and they founded a republic this is a thing that happened um so so lambert is a really great what if of the civil wars and the problem there is again uh you know he he was rivals a little bit with some of the other major generals mm. and so there were personality conflicts so they didn't want lambert to rise up above them they were all kind of equals and rivals you know within the new model army and within Cromwell's camp they were all together but once Cromwell is removed and now they're looking at each other and now they're rivals for power yeah nobody's nobody's going to want to necessarily say oh yeah Lambert he's the guy but they'll Mm. they'll rally around the kid who they can maybe control yeah so the other one though so that's that's on that's on one side that's on one side Lambert's on one side and the other is uh uh, obviously uh, Gerard Winstanley who is you know head of the diggers uh he is he is great fun and I remember when I was reading his stuff I mean, I one one of the first shirt, one of the first shirts that we did for uh, for fundraising. One of the first shirts was a digger shirt. That's you know, God told me to tell you that property is theft, mm. um, which is what they were up to over there. But when when Stanley, uh, his you know, you know this when you're when you're reading uh, 16th century and 17th century British English. It can be a slog, you know. It can be it can yeah. be very rough going. I mean, very not, circuitous. Yeah, not just yeah, exactly. Just not like, just in so terms said of this thing, and then we're going to say it slightly differently. And here are all these person's titles in full. Yeah, it's not like, just the these and the thous. I mean, you read you read uh, you read Clarendon. I make this joke where there was obviously a period shortage. You know, he was he was he was in exile. Yeah. He couldn't get his shipment of periods, so he had to just write the. He wrote a sentence that was five hundred words. For a sentence. Uh, and Win Stanley actually wrote in something that seems like very clear modern English. Mm-hmm. So reading him in the midst of all this other stuff that I was reading, it just on that alone, a stylistic note, it was like a breath of fresh air. And you can – I'm sure at the time people were like, "What? this is weird. This is very strangely written. But to the modern ear, what Win Stanley is writing uh, is, is quite clear and uh, very enjoyable to read as opposed to you know Clarendon, who is mm-hmm. great, but – you know, come on, man. Give, give a us, break. Give, yeah. it, give me a break. Be, like, be kind to your yeah, readers. Yeah, exactly. So you haven't taken any writing prompts from Clarendon then? I have not, that take, is, that I have is not really... taken writing prompts <laughs> from Clarendon. So speaking of the diggers, mm-hmm. um, I think this is kind of going to lead into your answer to this question. You've said before you wanted to take longer. If you could go back, you did yeah. uh, English, English Revolution mm-hmm. in... 15 episodes? I did it in, I think it was 16. 16 episodes. 15 or 16, yeah. And then your more recent ones have been much longer. Yes. If you went back Mm -hmm. and you did it again, Mm -hmm. what would you like to focus on? Oh, just everything. Yeah. I mean, I mean, mean, honestly, like, that's what it is. It's just everything. Um, I think, and I knew this at the time, by the time I was at episode five or episode six, um, that if I did it in the way that I, I would have written and talked about everything that I actually wanted to write and talk about. It would have been 50 episodes, mm. you know, 50, maybe 60 episodes. It would have been at least as long as the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, there's so much that I had to condense and not talk about and uh, dismiss with a sentence or two that could have been 10 episodes, yeah. you know, on, on all by itself. I mean, that... I mean, what do you say for 1637 to 1660? So you're talking about, let's just say, like 25 years. Um, and then, of course, you would want to talk more about, you know, the early days of Charles. So you're talking about like 30 years yeah. of 
some of the most chaotic, you know, multipolar. Because you got it. Because the thing you got to talk about everything that's happening in Ireland, everything is happening in Scotland, everything is taught, everything is going on in England. Every personality, every person, every event. Um, it's easily 50, 55 episodes. Yeah. Um, and it was so, you know, I, I went into it. I went into, I, I guess maybe I was naive about my own personality in the sense that like what I really want to do here is, is just do these in 12 to 15 episode discrete chunks. Because the, one of the, one of the, one of the things that I wanted to do with revolutions after the history of Rome was not do something that was so enormously epic. Mm. It was going to consume five years of my life, right? I wanted to do something that was a little bit quicker and cleaner, um, that I would be able to, you know, demonstrate a different side of my, um, a uh, different side of my knowledge base, a different side of my personality, um, and then move on to something else. Of course, here I am eight years later still doing it, um, and God knows how long the Russian Revolution is going to be, but it's just going to keep going and going. But the, the French Revolution is definitely – I made the decision to to really let the genie out of the bottle with the mm-hmm. French Revolution probably by about episode five or six of the English Civil War. I mean, I'm glad you did because the French Revolution is just – it's too much. Mu- yeah, it's too much. And and as soon and it, the, as soon as I made that decision, I just felt so good about it. Yeah. Um, because trying to ke- there's a problem with condensing the French Revolution. The French Revolution is over condensed, um, so that people have a very limited set of events that mm. you think of when you think of the French Revolution, and you miss the fact that it was ten years of just nonstop tumultuous change and drama and you really need to get into you do need to get into the weeds a little bit of of all the little twists and turns to fully appreciate what the french revolution is the french revolution had to be 55 episodes because if i had tried to make it 15 episodes it would have been no different than um you know there was a bankruptcy then the fall of the bastille then they chopped the king and then they chopped his head off and then napoleon yeah right now i'm just doing the same french revolution stick that that really anybody can do mm-hmm. um so that's when i think my voice uh, it's when i think the show got good i it's usually whenever you see someone's recommendation for revolutions mm-hmm. even though you know most everyone has heard of it um french revolution is up there is usually the one people go listen to that you just start with the and i and it's not wrong you know mm-hmm. start start with the french revolution i've told people that you know i was i was getting warmed up a bit um but even though, like, it was, it was clearly like I, I could very easily see myself going back and working with the English Civil War period again. I am Stuart England for life, you know. Like I like the um, the Tudors. I don't care about mm. World War Two, World War One. Like I, I'm not really super into 20th century history. Um, and Stuart. Stuart Britain is the best Britain. It is so interesting. Like, deciding when I was going to start Pax Britannica, 1688 was it was like, oh, that would be convenient, glorious revolution. It's not long from the Union of the, uh, the Act of Union. Mm-hmm. But then I thought, but I miss out so much. I miss out basically all the interesting Stuarts. All the interesting stuff and that happens in Stuart period. Like, it was a tough decision, but um, in the end, I'm very happy with what I did because now I get to go through it and devote 50, 60, 70 episodes to all of it. We're all looking forward to it. I'm very glad to hear that. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical, my two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. 
Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com, code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. Now, speaking of the French Revolution, um, and it's the same thing that happens with the American Revolution. And this may be because most of my knowledge about subsequent revolutions is from revolutions, and you may have just not spoken about it. But on, until the French Revolution, the go-to example of the great upheaval, the social uh, tumultuousness, is the English Civil War. Mm-hmm. But then after the French Revolution, the French Revolution kind of monopolizes that as yeah. the great thing to fear. Before that, it was the Civil War. They killed their king, and then the French Revolution does it. And they also kill thousands of other people and have the Great Terror and the Vendée and all this. It upscales the English Civil War. Yeah. So my question is basically, does the French Revolution just completely make the English Revolution obsolete as a lesson? Or does it still come up, but not as much? Well, I do think that it makes it obsolete. Mm. If, um, you know, you, you'll get, during the French Revolution you will definitely get people accusing, for example, Lafayette of wanting to be Cromwell, yeah. right? This is this is a pretty standard accusation that was leveled against Lafayette, that he wanted to be the next Oliver Cromwell. Yeah. So at the time of the French Revolution, they were all still very aware of what had happened up there. But also, when the, you know, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms are going on, when the English Revolution is happening, let's face it, uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland are not a huge deal in global affairs and not even in European affairs. Um, at all the other great powers of Europe kind of, I mean, they were just going through and coming out of the 30 years war. So, you know, Charles is sitting there like, help me. And they're like, dude, no, we're, yeah. no, we're done with war for like at least two and a half years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for at least, <laughs> for, at least for at yeah. least 18 months. We don't want to have a war for at least 18 months. Um, God, Europeans are so fucking <laughs> bloodthirsty. It is insane. Um, but, the, the French Revolution taking place in France, which was a huge, rich, and powerful nation smack dab in the middle of the continent, mm. that then, yes, wasn't just about, you know, we chopped the king's head off and now things are a little bit different. It was, we chopped the king's head off and now we've, we're at war. Now we've created 25 years of war mm. that is going to transform the whole world, you know, it transforms European affairs, both because Napoleon goes out and brings administrative reform and legal reform and political reform and all of this stuff that goes with the French armies when they land someplace and when they start administering it, when Napoleon is then pushed back, a lot of that stuff is then left behind. The Napoleonic code is, is, is going to be left behind in a lot of yeah. places in that way. Um, that, yeah, by the time, if, if it's 1830 or 1840, you know, I wrote that I wrote that episode for the series on 1848 called The Spectre of the French Revolution about how everybody was really obsessed with this huge thing. And I, I really do think it's just, it was so huge and affected so many people <clears throat> that it really does blot out any mention or any need to mention, you know, Cromwell and yeah. Charles I, which, you know, happened on, a, on an island off the coast and didn't really affect anybody else except the people living in, in Britain mm. and Ireland, of course. So, before we move on to more general questions about revolutions, you mentioned it before. Do you think Cromwell wanted to be king? I do not. You do not? I do not. I think that the way that you know that Cromwell did not want to be king is that they asked him to be king, and he said no. I think that can be taken as evidence (laughs) on a very basic level that Cromwell did not want to be king. Um, Did he want to have something that was like being a king, but different? Yeah. I mean, in the same way that Napoleon wanted to be a king, but he knew he couldn't call himself a king, the same way that Caesar and Augustus wanted to be king, but they knew they couldn't call themselves king. So is part of it just strictly on a, on a political level? He doesn't feel like he should make that move politically to actually try to like sort of raise himself to the purple or to the crown? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so that that's a cynical way of saying that Cromwell didn't want to be king. But it also seems quite clear to me um, in terms of the two constitutions that were written under his auspices that he was giving his stamp of approval to, he wanted power sharing in government. He wanted there to be a parliament and a council of state and an executive who were balancing each other, who were checking each other, that, that authority, that um, 
you know, this is all pre Montesquieu, mm-hmm. but you know, he's he's working. They're working out of Aristotle. Like, I mean, this, these these ideas aren't new, but he was. Attempting to create something that was different than what Charles I was trying to assert, which is that I'm the king and I get to do whatever I want. Cromwell did want something different from that. And the thing that drove him crazy, he the reason he gets this justifiable reputation for also being an autocrat while not wanting to be a king is anytime people then sort of like did what they wanted to do against what he wanted them to do, he'd, he'd clear them out. You know, yeah. he'd say he'd, he'd send in the soldiers and clear out this parliament and that parliament and, um, and bare bones is part, you know, see you later because you guys aren't doing it right. Yeah. You know, so you gotta, you gotta do it right. And you're not doing it right. And you got Hasselreg in there. It's like, oh, yeah. um, yelling about the, yelling about the sovereignty of parliament and, and Crom- Cromwell was trying to do something that, what would eventually be closer to what the UK has yeah. right now. Um, but I don't believe, I mean, if, if his idea had been, I want to make myself into like an all powerful King, he could have done it. Absolutely. He could have done it. He had the means he had the, if he had the motivation, he had the means to do it. And mm-hmm. he could have said, okay, right. New thing. King Oliver, the first, Let's do this. Yeah. And he didn't do that. He spent like 10 years trying to do anything but that. And even when they literally said, this isn't going to work unless we have a king, like the whole legal system is based off of having a sovereign mm. at the middle of it. And and all of our precedents don't work um, for some reason because we're, we're, we're weirdly litigious British people. Um, it doesn't, our laws don't function unless we have a sovereign in the middle of it. Um, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. So mm. I think that that, at least in my mind, is enough to convince me that no, I don't think that Oliver Cromwell wanted to be king. And is it still a revolution to you after six oh, years of other revolutions? No, absolutely, you, more than yeah. ever, more than yeah. ever, more than ever. Of course. Um, the the other story that gets told about the the, the British often tell themselves, um, and you know, I say this with a great deal of love in my heart. I don't know if I need to list all of the British TV shows and British people that I love <laughs> before I can make fun of the British people. Um, that, oh, well, when we have a revolution, oh, it's so bloodless. And everybody, everybody is just, everybody just, we got together in a room. And because you guys are referencing the glorious revolution, yeah. right? Oh, well, everybody got together in a room and then we were like, okay, well, we know we can't have everything that we want, but also I'll give with you and we'll have a nice compromise and we'll get rid of, we'll get rid of James and we'll bring in this Dutch guy and then we'll have a hostile takeover of Dutch bankers and we'll create the, uh, the Bank of England and it'll be great. Um, and there will be no blood. And you're like, well, if you, if you go back like 20 years, there, there's a reason they did it in a bloodless way in 1688 and 1689. And it's mm. because they had all, you know, if not lived through personally, you know, were at least children uh, during the 1640s and 1650s. They had all lived through it. So uh, I think that the idea that you could have a giant civil war that results in the king being overthrown, having his head chopped off, and then not putting in just some other monarch. I mean, the War of the Roses, you know, we, you know, dynastic struggles are, are, is, uh, are utterly commonplace. Yeah. You know, there, there's two heads of rival dynasties. They're fighting a civil war to see which one is going to be the head of what would essentially be the same political apparatus, mm-hmm. right? But just who's going to be in charge of it. And when Cromwell and the new modern army win the civil war, they don't just reinstate the same thing. They don't just recreate what had already existed with King Oliver in place of King Charles. They were trying to create a Republic. They tried to do something completely different. There were, um, and you know, you can say that the levelers and the diggers and the, and the shakers and the Quakers and the, um, every other er sect that's out there, um, <clears throat> that they were, it, it's not like this was some mass movement. I mean, the levelers were a limited number of people. The mm-hmm. diggers were like a hundred, 200 people like max, but the ideas were floating around out there yeah. and the ideas that were underlying, um, what they thought they were fighting for, you know, in the Putney debates, right? Like the Putney debates, they're arguing about advancing new political ideas and injecting new political ideas into the political bloodstream of Britain. Mm-hmm. This is all revolutionary. Right. This none of all of this tracks and compares um, and parallels the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, the Russian Revolution that I'm doing right now, the Mexican Revolution, which I covered. All of this involved those same kinds of new political ideas being injected into the bloodstream of a nation in the midst of a civil war that was partly driven by arguments over what should be the political 
philo- what's the political philosophy of this country? It's not just who should rule. Mm-hmm. It's what should be the political philosophy of this country. And I think that that debate was being had out on the battlefield in the Civil War. And so, yeah, I absolutely think it's a revolution. And a, and a revolutionary event in world history. Absolutely, it was. Very good. Yeah, very good argument. Because that is a, it's a contentious issue, whether it is a revolution or not. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, con- um, it's um, uh, Conrad... Uh, Russell. Conrad Russell, of course. The bourgeois both, on both sides. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, Conrad Russell's thing is, is that it was a civil war. And, he, I mean, he knows, I don't know, five million times. I mean, he did. He's dead now. But, I mean, so I, I know more. I, <laughs> so know more so than technically, I know more than Conrad Russell does <laughs> about the English Civil Wars right now at this moment. Um, and I just think that when I, re- when I read through what he was writing in the 70s and 80s, I just think it was the logical conclusion of a series of revisionist moves mm. that they kept trying to revise. They were trying to revise against Marxism because Marxism was trying to establish um, – the English Civil War is the first great bourgeois revolution in historical materialism. And so because the revisionists in the 60s and 70s wanted to move away from that, I think it took them to what ultimately became somewhat of an absurd conclusion that this incredibly revolutionary event was actually just a civil war and it was just people fighting over power and nothing else was going on. I think that that goes way, 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 way too far. With, okay. apo- with, with apologies to the late Conrad Russell, whose books I read and loved. Yeah, it's a fantastic scholar, but, you know, he is dead, so he can't, he can't talk it, back to you now. Yeah. So. And you do know more than him right now. Right now. Right, we, now. right now, we both know more. I know. That's, a, that's, that's a, quite that's the confidence a, boost. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we know more than Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically true. We're yeah. just two guys sitting around who are smarter than every other smart person who has lived before us. This is great. <laughs> so is there, um, obviously, after... After the, the Russian Revolution, mm-hmm. what's next? Is oh. that the last? Because I can't remember whether you have something else in the works. I'm sure you have no end of suggestions coming in every day. Right. Oh, why aren't you covering this civil war, this revolution? Correct. Is there something afterwards? I think this is it. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I haven't... This is, this can be your little scooplet oh, okay. that you get. Because I will, be, I will be saying something about this before the end of the year. I do... I'm planning on ending revolutions in the summer of 2021. Roughly, it's going to coincide with the Lafayette book mm. coming out. Um, those two things are just going to dovetail very nicely. And, and when I saw those two pieces sort of fall into place, I was like, oh, that's it. That's that's how this is going to go. This is, feels so right. Um, and there was a question, how long will it take me to get through Russia? And then if there is still time between when I finish Russia and when – the summer 2021 comes on, is something else going to go in there? There will be something that comes after the Russian Revolution. There Mm -hmm. is going to be like a capstone to the project. But I do now think that what I'm up to over here is writing my last revolution in terms of uh, the grand narrative history that I've been up to. And there will be a thing that comes back where we we go back through and we we sort of, uh, we're we're going to analyze everything that we've talked about and see if we can't figure out you know, I already I already wrote an episode called well, "What the Heck Just Happened" to to try to deal with the revolutions of 1848, mm. but it'll essentially be "What the Heck Just Happened" on like a very grand scale. Yeah, of, of, years. yeah of, of covering everything from you know beginning with beginning with the English Civil Wars and then going through the Russian Revolution, um, but then as we've sort of talked about a little bit with the French Revolution being when I sort of got really good at it. Yeah, um, you know that period between like 1789 and 1917, like what. What honestly happened here? Because something huge happened, and I would like to talk about the process of revolution and talk about um, are there similarities? Can you predict these sorts of things? Like there's a lot of sociological research that goes into all this stuff. Um, So that'll probably be the end of it. But I don't think right now – I think what I'm writing is my last revolution. And will you do another podcast after that? Yeah, probably. Good. I don't. I don't think I'm allowed to quit. No. I don't think that anybody. Will, you, I don't think anybody will let me have no, it. No, no, no. Um, so I will definitely take. I will definitely take a break. Um, but there's more books I want to write. Um, after after the revolutions ends, I'm probably going to try to do uh, like uh, live shows. Uh, as opposed to just, they won't just be me coming and doing like a recording of a podcast, but actually like a, you know, 90 minutes with Mike Duncan on some new topic of my choosing, um, tour around on that a little bit, just to do something, just to do something different. I've, yeah. I have been podcasting for when I'm done, I will have been podcasting for, um, again, we're not mathematicians over here. So 2007 to 2021 is 14, 14 years. Yeah. That's I about right. Hope so. Otherwise yeah. That's- 
we're terrible at math. Yeah, no, I have no idea. I am terrible at math. That's why I do history. Yeah, exactly the same thing with me. So we'll uh, because we're running out of time, we'll just finish off with some fun little ones. Mm. Um, what cool. event I like fun. of the Russian Revolution are you most excited to talk about? Because I, I, it's my favorite revolution. Okay. I think I learned it in school, and I love it so much. So I'm very curious what you are excited. The most exciting thing. The the most exciting single thing. Um, I don't know that I have like a single little bit mm. that I'm really interested in talking about. What gets my what gets my motor running what, when I start thinking about it? And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to be good. Is that so many histories of the Russian Revolution? And I know. I think I talked about this. Have a tendency to be. You know, the story of Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrowing the czar and then taking over and creating the Soviet Union, you know, and even that little story just kind of blows right past the February Revolution. And I want to do I'm I'm excited about doing the same thing for the Russian Revolution as I did with the French Revolution is is introducing and fleshing out all of the factions that were involved in this. I mean, the Bolsheviks were just one faction and it's, and it, and it, it doesn't even come down to just the Bolsheviks versus the Mensheviks, which is like, if you're going to add some, um, some sophisticated color to your telling of the Russian revolution, you might get that far mm-hmm. just sort of in, in popular history. Yeah, I don't mean, yeah, among yeah. academics, but in popular history, but there are anarchists, there are, uh, there are the SRs, there's an, an, every single nationality uh, that was a part of the Russian empire, uh, the Poles and, uh, Germans in the Baltic States. And you got, you got Muslims in East Asia, everybody's rising. Like there is so much that happened simultaneously that it's really, bringing all of those stories up to the surface and giving them equal treatment. I mean, obviously the Bolsheviks are going to win, but you know, in 1916 where the Bolsheviks, I mean, Lenin, you know, Lenin was in Switzerland convinced that he had missed the revolution that like 1905 had come and gone and it didn't work. And now he was going to die without ever seeing the revolution. Like that's, that's where Lenin was at on Mm -hmm. the eve of the revolution. So, and this may be something you haven't quite got an opinion on yet, but who is most frustrating to you? Charles the first, oh, God. Louis the sixteenth, oh, oh, Charles the tenth, or Nicholas the second. I, 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 they're all very stubborn. I no. Well, I think it's going to be that um, that Charles the first and Nicholas the second are going to wind up probably tied for most frustrating in all of the revolutions that I have done. Um, I have yet to meet anybody who frustrates me as much as Charles the first does. I mean, Charles the 10th was a, was a dumbass, Yeah. Right. And, uh, and Louis the 16th, it's really clear. I just kind of feel sorry for him that yeah. he was, he was just, it, he was just absolutely in over his head and he got, he was, I feel sorry for Louis the 16th. I don't feel sorry for Marie Antoinette. I feel sorry for Louis the Sixteenth, and I do. Yeah. I, I have a difference there. Yes, yeah, I, that is... I, have, I have. I have a small. I have a small grudge against Marie Antoinette because I think she. Because I mean, her and the Comte d'Artois, who becomes Charles the Tenth, I think that they fall under the category of dumbasses, uh, as opposed to really frustratingly stubborn. Like, why are you doing this? Yeah. Like, just do anything but what you're doing right now, and you'll probably be fine, and your country will probably be fine, and your people will probably be fine, but you just won't do it. Um, so we'll see. Right now, Charles the Ten- or Charles the First is absolutely still the leader in the clubhouse for most frustrating ruler that we have talked about. But Nikki too could take it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he's a very frustrating person. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll, we will finish off there. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much it's for having amazing. me. That was fun. I'm going to have to in three, four, five. Whenever I get to the American Revolution, I will have to track you down wherever it is that you are in the world. Oh yeah, there was there was an American Revolution. Yeah, you, you know, man, the, man, the English Civil War is more revolutionary than the American Revolution. Well, um, Whoa, yeah, this yeah, that was yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, I just threw down a gauntlet. Wow, I don't that's, that's I don't know if I actually believe that. No, it was just something. It, it was something bold to say you at just the said end of the show. More than Einstein, so you know, you, I do. You're throwing these everywhere. These gauntlets. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's a good way and, to go out. <laughs> and yes, I look forward to listening to the rest of uh, Russian Revolution. Oh, good. I look forward to writing it. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Mike Duncan. I'd like to give special thanks to the team behind Sound Education, particularly the main organisers, Zachary Davis, Joseph Fridman, and Ray Belli. Ray, in particular, was a star in arranging the space for me to actually hold an interview. It was not a simple process, especially when he was juggling about 50 other things, and he handled it like a champ. Similarly, special thanks to Casey, Katie, and everyone at Harvard's Learning Lab for being so welcoming and helpful in setting up their space. 
And finally, of course, thanks to Mike for taking the time to meet with me. He was in great demand, and I really appreciated it. Next time, we continue the narrative of Pax Britannica. Charles I is still a decade away from complete disaster, but he's getting plenty of practice even now. He still clings to the toxic Duke of Buckingham, even as more and more of the favourite's unpopularity starts sticking to him as well. Soon enough, the decision about what to do with George Villiers will be taken violently out of the king's hands. 